Step 3. One photon sources. We have seen the form for the general one photon wave packet given by the following superposition here. It's a su superposition over all the states where we have a one photon in the mode M. But we have not really talked about what these probability amplitudes are, this C, M, these complex numbers there. Can we set them to be anything as long as they satisfy the normalization uh, condition? In principle, yes, but in the wor real world, not really. Since they uh, should represent real single photons coming from real sources, the properties of these sources should somehow determine what these probability amplitudes are. So let's see how we can uh, take that into account in our description of single photons. Imagine a two-level atom undergoing the process of spontaneous emission. So what we do is at time zero, we excite our atom from the ground state to its excited state. The energy difference between these two states is given by h bar omega naught. And the atom, the upper level, has a uh, lifetime given by gamma to the power of minus one. After some time, given by t minus t naught, much larger than the lifetime of the excited, uh, excited level, the atom will jump back to its ground state, emitting a photon. And this photon can be described by the following wave packet, by the following superposition. The question that we ask first is, in this scenario, what is the frequency of this photon? Is it the usual frequency coming from our intuition, coming from Bohr's model of the atom? namely that the frequency of the photon is given by the energy difference of the two levels, in our case h bar omega naught? No, in fact it is not. The excited level has a finite lifetime, which leads to the atom uh, emitting photons with a distribution of frequencies. This is a direct consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If the atom has longer lifetime and spends more time in the excited level, it will emit energy and this energy will have some uh, fluctuations. In other words, there will be some uncertainty related with this energy. But this uncertainty in energy is related to how long the atom spent in its excited state. Therefore, the longer it spends as an excited state, the fluctuations in energy will be narrower meaning the distribution of the frequencies will also be narrower and it will emit much more closely to h bar omega naught. However, if the photon is unstable, the distribution of frequencies should be larger, should be more broad, given by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, let's make this a little bit more quantitative. Here on the horizontal axis, we are plotting the photon frequency. In other words, the frequency of the emitted photon. And on the vertical axis, it's the spectral distribution. In other words, uh, how are the frequencies distributed of the emitted photons? We see that the peak of the distribution is at the omega naught, the energy, the frequency difference of the two energy levels. And this gamma is, gives us the width of this distribution. Here we can directly see what we said in the previous slide. That stable atomic levels, meaning long lifetimes, long lifetimes imply small gamma. Remember, the lifetime is the inverse of gamma. So long lifetimes imply narrow emission spectrum. So most of the frequency of the atom is uh, concentrated around omega naught. However, unstable atomic levels with short lifetimes, where short lifetimes implies large gamma, in other words, large width of the distribution imply that the photon frequencies that are emitted from this source are distributed over a large range around omega naught. So let's get back to our one photon wave packet and try to see how we can incorporate this knowledge into the form of these probability amplitudes CM. Now, the calculation of the CM is quite involved, so we are just going to state the final result and point you to where you can le learn more about it in our section on further reading. 
So consider a photon wave packet, one photon wave packet of length L. The CMs are given by the following expression. Each CM depends on the frequency uh, omega m, and where this k is some normalization factor. We, soon we will get to it. So we see that CMs are time dependent. Depending on when we look at uh, the, the photon, this, it will acquire a different complex phase. And here in the denominator, we've got the following expression. You might be a little bit scared that it's a complex form, but that's no problem. If we take the modulus squared, in other words, the probability that the photon has this particular frequency omega m, we obtain the following distribution. We have k squared divided by the difference between omega m and uh, the energy, the frequency difference between excited and ground state squared plus gamma squared divided by 4, where gamma determines our lifetime of the excited level. We require that the sum of these probabilities over all the modes must be equal to 1. This leads to the following normalization factor of square root of c times gamma divided by l, where l is the uh, length of the wave packet. This particular distribution, which is in fact what we have plotted on the previous uh, uh, slide, is called a Lorentzian shape. So, the main point to take away here is that the lifetime determines the one photon state. It determines these probability amplitudes, CM, that we use in the superposition expansion of the one photon wave packet. How do we detect single photons? We have seen one way of detecting single photons in one of our previous lessons, and we introduced the notion of photomultiplier tubes, or PMTs, which are an early application of the photoelectric effect. In here, the photon comes in, it hits a metal plate, and uh, this metal plate ejects one photoelectron. This photoelectron that undergoes a cascade transformation through many different dynodes at different voltages, producing a current that can be actually measured. And these, uh, uh, these photomultiplier tubes have efficiencies of approximately 35% or less, depending on the frequency of the uh, single photons. More advanced versions are known as the single photon avalanche diodes, or SPADs. The idea behind them is very similar, but the materials used in their constructions are quite different. So they're the semiconductor version of the photomultiplier tubes. Here, a single photon liberates one charge carrier, and this charge carrier is then accelerate, accelerated through a very strong electric field. And the kinetic energy that it acquires is far beyond the ionization energy needed to, uh, needed to emit further carriers from the material. And these are then also accelerated through the same strong electric field, causing an avalanche of carriers being generated, generating a current that can then be detected and measured. And the quantum efficiencies of uh, SPADs are somewhere of the order of 65%. Now, the cutting edge of single photon detection relies on superconducting. In particular, uh, superconducting transition edge sensors, TESs. So, this is a superconducting film near a superconducting transition. What this means is that if a single photon comes in and hits the superconducting film, it can heat the detector sufficiently that it causes a measurable change in resistance of the detector. Superconducting uh, effect is if you cool a particular material below a certain transition temperature, then it loses all of its resistance. Whereas, as we said now, single photon can cause enough heat in the detector that it destroys the superconducting effect, and we can measure the resistance of, we can measure finite resistance in the detector. Now, these uh, uh, such uh, detectors are very advanced and require uh, operation temperatures of the order of uh, one or a few Kelvin. S but their quantum efficiencies are extremely high, around 95% and sometimes beyond. They're not really commercially available, but if you want to do cutting edge experiments such as long distance QKD, you better use uh, detectors using superconducting effect.